Jules Polonetsky, CEO of the Future Privacy Forum, co-founder of the Institute and uh, um, Oracle of all things privacy in DC and out of DC. Welcome everybody. Thanks for uh, being with us this morning. Um, there's a lot going on in Israel. There's a lot going on at the other sessions. And so we're delighted to have an audience interested in this issue that has become one of the dominant uh, debates uh, in uh, recent years in the US, in Israel, uh, in Europe, and uh, elsewhere in the world, the relationship of uh, privacy, data, and competition. Um, regulators throughout the world are thinking through what role data plays in a complicated world where uh, data is a risk, data is an asset. Uh, we were at an event uh, yesterday where somebody said data is a weapon uh, from, from where they sit. Um, obviously, uh, data is a human rights issue. Uh, and so we're delighted to have uh, with us today some of the leaders uh, in that uh, discussion. Um, just a brief word at the Future of Privacy Forum and the Israel Tech Policy Institute. Uh, our role is to try to be a bridge between some of those issues, to work with the leaders at companies, in government, in civil society, in academia, uh, because nobody has actually that full truth. And by uh, thinking and working hard and debating, uh, we can hopefully come up with policies and practices and codes and ethical paths forward, and of course law that, uh, that can shape the kinds of uh, progress, innovation, and success we want. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, two of our um, uh, special uh, visitors, um, both making first visits, yeah, both making their first uh, uh, visit to Israel, and uh, I think really uh, having an opportunity to, to see the, um, the, the challenges, the opportunities, and, and the beauty of the, um, uh, the people and the issues and, and the uh, thinking that is going on in this country. Um, I'll introduce uh, Helen Dixon uh, first. Uh, actually, Helen and Rohit are both gonna, I believe, uh, come up. Um, Helen Dixon is the uh, Data Protection Commissioner, the DPC, for those of us who uh, uh, like to use uh, quick initials to, to show that we know the lay of the land, the Data Protection Commissioner uh, of uh, Ireland. Um, she, uh, in addition to setting uh, and interpreting uh, the uh, law, I won't say setting the law, because Helen's always very clear that the regulators and legislators set the law, um, and she has a key role, obviously, in uh, interpreting and enforcing uh, and guiding and uh, and training uh, in addition to the many many thousands of companies in Ireland the many companies in uh, Israel that do business in Europe and that may have uh, Ireland as their uh, lead um, uh, location uh, as well as many of the uh, global companies uh, who are headquartered in uh, Ireland uh, for a whole range of reasons probably the most important the uh, incredible people and the uh, the tech talent uh, there so uh, Helen and plays uh, a, uh, a key role uh, for uh, many of us who are, are looking and following uh, to see this. Um, Commissioner Rohit Chopra, Rohit, I keep saying Rohit, Rohit Chopra, uh, is um, a member uh, of the uh, U.S. Federal Trade Commission. Uh, he's emerged as one of the thoughtful and, um, uh, and uh, provocative, often, uh, voices um, urging the agency to use its authorities um, to the maximum, to look hard at the opportunities that it has under its legislative statute to really be uh, an effective uh, regulator. So he's uh, regularly making news, regularly um, really helping advance the debate, and has had um, uh, an important voice in particular in the intersection between uh, privacy and competition. So let me uh, ask you to welcome our, uh, our visitors and uh, for them to uh, come up and uh, Helen will have the floor first. Thank you. Good morning everyone. It's a real pleasure to join you here today. Um, my great thanks to the Managing Director of the Israel Tech Policy Institute, Limor, uh, not only for inviting me here and giving me this opportunity to talk to you all today, but also actually for putting together a really amazing program for me around Cyber Week, uh, where I've had the chance to make great new contacts that are of super value to me, uh, but she's also connected me in new conversations uh, that I know are going to enhance my regulatory capability and perspective, uh, and certainly have already enhanced my enjoyment of my work. 
Uh, on that, it's been a real bonus for me this week to participate in a lot of sessions at Cyber Week alongside the very esteemed Federal Trade Commissioner Rohit Chopra, uh, from whom I'm learning so much already. So I'm not going to spend any time uh, introducing myself or the Irish Data Protection Authority because Jules has done a very good job of that already. The, the key context to remember is I'm speaking uh, as the authority that is the enforcer as against the big tech platforms uh, under the General Data Protection Regulation. So this morning what I want to uh, focus on is uh, really what I'm going to describe as the extremes of admiring the problems that we see in the data protection world uh, and where that has ultimately led us to now, for better or for worse, uh, and where we're going to see changes uh, deriving from very shortly as a result of enforcement actions. Uh, and today I'm going to focus uh, the comments that I make largely around the area of targeted advertising that, as you all know, relies on tracking and profiling all of us uh, as we use so-called free internet services. And I'm focusing on that use case because it easily lends itself to making the points uh, that I want to emphasize today, but I'm also focusing on that use case because as the EU lead supervisory authority for the big tech platforms, it takes up an inordinate amount of our time uh, dealing with those issues, uh, the issues of profiling and tracking of, of users and non-users of services are of huge concern to my fellow EU data protection authorities. So no surprise to all of you, I, I go to quite a few data protection specific conferences uh, and at all of those events, uh, I hear lots of great speakers talking very passionately uh, about their data protection issues and their stories that really illustrate uh, the harms get, that can derive when our personal data is misused and when we're subject to so-called surveillance capitalism. Uh, we know now very much more than we did uh, a short while ago about the disruption to democracy from election manipulation the chilling effects on free speech and right to protest, the oppression we all suffer from that constant tracking of ourselves online and offline to more accurately reflect back to us what we should buy, what we should think, what we should read, what music we should listen to. Uh, we know more about the harms to children and teenagers, not just from issues like cyberbullying, but also general exposure to an internet that wasn't designed with their protection in mind. And these are just some of the everyday realities of this post-internet era. Uh, but when I was starting my preparations for today's event, maybe because I was in Brussels about 10 days ago marking one year of GDPR application with the EU Commission, I, I found myself thinking about the recent uh, European Parliament elections that took place in the EU last month, and I was thinking about the huge gains made by the Green parties, uh, and we saw this nowhere more obviously than in Ireland, where they made a, a huge comeback in terms of the number of seats that they won. And of course, they're very much riding that wave of renewed interest and concern on the part of the public about climate change. And throughout the debates uh, for the Parliament elections, we heard frequently that the United Nations describes this as the defining issue of our times. And this reminded me then in turn about a dinner I attended uh, about eight months ago in London. It was at the Royal College of Physicians in London where a sibling of mine was being honored and I attended as her guest. So, I sat at the top table for dinner. I was surrounded by all sorts of medical practitioners. And because they knew each other well and I was something of a, a novelty to them, they were very interested to know about my work, what it was aimed at. So I talked to them about the GDPR, uh, a little bit about what the regulatory office does. Uh, and then for dramatic effect, I wound up with a brief synopsis of the Israeli historian Noah Yuval Harari's Homo Deus bestseller. I hope I did it justice. But I talked to them a little bit about his views on the potential evolutionary path for Homo sapiens, uh, given what he predicts as a very powerful and, and rapid merging of biology and ICT, uh, and his fears that we're going to create a useless class of unemployed and unemployable people. So I thought that would impress them. But the cardiologist looked at me very sadly and looked at me as if I lived under a rock. Uh, and they said, but we're never going to get to that point of the useless class of human beings, they said, because of obesity. 
uh, and they said this is the real and imminent threat to humankind where there is an actual risk now of children dying younger than their parents and, and they weren't buying the theories about gene swapping uh, as a way to stop that onslaught. So it's very difficult to argue with climate change and obesity and the existential threats that they pose. Uh, and it's probably not important to have a competition to establish what is really the defining issue of our times. But I think we now know that data privacy and data protection uh, are connected with all of these bigger existential issues. When we consider the effects of misinformation in terms of what people know and understand about climate change, voter manipulation in terms of who we elect as our leaders, and then that personalization of our news feeds to all of us that uh, feeds the biases that we already have. And of course, issues like the targeting of children uh, with fast food ads uh, are certainly going to have their impact on some of these bigger issues. So more and more often, the uh, issues that I'm hearing people talk about are the need to better protect children online. First of all, by identifying that they are children so that we can ensure that they can only access age-appropriate material, making sure consumers really do have choice in the market so that they can pick more privacy-enhanced solutions. Um, we hear people talking all the time about the need to make privacy notices shorter, clearer, more concise, so that people uh, understand what they're consenting to. And a lot of you will be familiar with very clever academic studies that have measured how many person hours it would take to read the privacy notices for all the websites and apps uh, that each of us uses every year. And then on the other hand, we hear people saying we have to get rid of that model of putting pressure on the user to read a big privacy policy and consent. Uh, it has to be eliminated. And these kind of statements that we hear more and more often, they're not just made by privacy campaigners and activists. We hear politicians talking about these issues more often, academics, journalists very, very frequently, to some extent members of the public, and of course, data protection authorities. And yet for all the increased uh, chatter about these issues and their importance, uh, nothing much seems to have changed, even post-GDPR. Uh, and as all of you know, the GDPR came into application about 13 months ago. Important things to remember about it are that it's, it's technology neutral, it's very high level and principles based, but it does put obligations on all organizations and sectors. It tries to give more control to individuals, allowing them to exercise rights, and then it creates a very strong role for authorities like mine in enforcing uh, the principles. And I think it's a very sound, high-level framework, but because it's so high-level, it leaves a lot of work to organizations and sectors themselves, and also to, regulate, to regulators uh, like my own office to figure out. So an example is that Recital 38 of the GDPR, it calls out that children merit specific protections because it says they may be simply less aware of the risks, but it doesn't go on to tell us anything uh, about how we should implement on those specific protections. Uh, and, and we know that while the terms of service for the platforms may require individuals to be over 13 years of age, there's really no normative approach yet to achieving verification of whether any individual online is over 13 years of age. And if any of you have been following what's going on in the UK as they've attempted to introduce a now delayed age gate to access legal pornography, Nobody is happy with the solution that's been implemented in legislation in the UK. Nobody thinks it's reasonable, proportionate, uh, or desirable. So maybe I'm wrong, and I'll be delighted if all of you tell me uh, that I'm wrong in this case, but it seems to me, based on the academic literature that I read and the specialist journalistic pieces like the New York Times Privacy Project, that uh, there is a very huge propensity in this area towards admiring the problems that we have. And it's the same problems year in, year out, and actually decade in, decade out at this stage. And the descriptions of the problems grow ever more beautiful and clever in terms of uh, highlighting the issues that are there. But I wonder if the solutions are getting any closer. What are those solutions to the deficiencies of reading privacy policies and having to give our consent? What are the solutions to, uh, proportionate solutions to identifying children and vulnerable users 
uh, online and protecting them? And what is the solution to the excessive tracking and profiling of all of us online in order to monetize our data? And of course, if there isn't a solution in law that says you can't monetize data, any solution that we consider has to reflect the reality that the big platforms are not going to voluntarily uh, give up the business model that they have, which they know yields the greatest income. So we've had lots of uh, solutions and standards that promote state-of-the-art security uh, in ICT and internet context, but we've less solutions in the privacy space. There are some contributions like differential privacy, but those old chestnut issues that I've talked about uh, always seem to remain. And I think none of us want to accept that a solution to all of this is that consumer expectations uh, have to be diminished and accept uh, that we are going to be less protected. So according to a 2012 paper from uh, the two Israeli Tech Policy Institute founders that introduced us earlier, uh, Polonetsky and Tanay, they wrote a paper in 2012 on advancing transparency and individual control in online behavioral advertising. It was a, an even longer title than that. But they said the ultimate solution is that policymakers need to come to deep value judgments in a nuanced way that reflect the need both for privacy protection but also the benefits of economic efficiency and free access to information services. And they point out that once you make those value judgments and the balancing test, that will then dictate where the informational norms should be in terms of transparency, opt-in, opt-out, and what acceptable data uses are. But seven years later, I don't see any evidence that the debate around those deep value judgments has moved on in any way. If anything, we've moved in the direction that Polonetsky and Tanay suggest is the wrong approach, uh, where we've now backed ourselves, and we, I mean all of us, uh, in, into a corner uh, where we're examining these issues through the legal mechanics of what the law says about notice and consent. Uh, and I think partly this is because nobody knows who the policy makers are uh, that are being talked about when we say that policy makers should make uh, these deep value judgments. In an EU context, the policy maker is the EU Commission, but what it proposed was a very high-level uh, principles-based law. So as Jules said earlier, I think it is important to understand that the GDPR has now cast EU data protection authorities, like my office, very much in the role of enforcers. It's one of the big innovations of the GDPR that these big administrative fines and corrective powers were given to the data protection authorities. And while Article 57 reflects a very broad range of tasks for data protection authorities, such as issuing guidance, promoting awareness of risks, and advisory role to parliaments around new legislation that will connect, collect rather personal data, what we are is essentially quasi-judicial decision-making bodies. So in the context of any investigation that we open and ultimately enforcement action, we're expected to find the facts, first of all. We're then expected to state what legal issues those facts engage. We're required to conduct a legal analysis, and ultimately we make findings as, whether, as to whether there is compliance with the law as it's stated uh, or not, and then we go on to uh, decide uh, what punishment in the form of a fine or corrective uh, powers that we intend to apply. And maybe before the GDPR as a data protection authority, we'd a little bit more scope to publicly comment in ways that might be said to reflect a policy position or a value judgment. Uh, but now we have to be extremely careful because we will be uh, alleged to uh, have uh, infected our investigation and decision-making process with bias if we come out with a statement uh, in advance saying where it is that we intend to go. So I, I think uh, in, in terms of the investigations that the Irish DPC has opened now currently under the GDPR, it was predictable the direction that those investigations were going to be pushed in. Because the non-governmental organizations that are concerned with data protection in Europe, they had already flagged well in advance that they were going to come after the, the big American platforms as it is. Uh, and the types of issues that they were going to raise about these fundamental issues about is it really transparent to us what's being collected? Is our consent really uh, real? Uh, is it proportionate the level of, of, of tracking and surveillance uh, when we engage with these free internet services? So now we have uh, 
21 very large scale investigations open uh, into all of these large companies. And we don't have total control as a data protection authority over the, the ultimate end outcome because under the GDPR one-stop shop, there's a cooperation and consistency mechanism, which means when I come to a conclusion of an investigation and a decision-making process, I have to bring it to all of the other EU data protection authorities, uh, and they get to input. So I suppose ultimately what I'm saying is, with regard to the investigations that we now have open, particularly as concerns this so-called ad tech space, we are moving as far away from what's going to be a nuanced policy judgment approach in terms of what's going to fall out. So my final message today is that there has to be a better way of approaching all of these issues than allowing it unravel to a point where we're conducting investigations against the mechanics of what the law requires in these types of areas. Uh, and so I think there's a role for academics in, in terms of propo proposing solutions and bringing forward more evidence bases that can ground the type of policy judgments that need to be made. There's a far greater role for industry to get ahead of where we know uh, the NGOs are going to push us in terms of investigating issues and where regulators uh, are going to fo focus their efforts and resources. Uh, and I think there's a role then for regulators in working with industry, particularly in developing codes of conduct far more proactively that are going to uh, avoid the need where we come to very hard ends on some of these issues. Because as I say, once it goes to the 28 EU data protection authorities that may be involved in the decision making, and where the corrective powers include halting processing operations, uh, we may end up uh, at, at, at very stark dead ends that don't, uh, that don't meet our needs and that don't uh, uh, create that nuanced balance between data protection and access to information services. So a better way forward, more proactive working together. Thank you.